Well, before we really get going this morning, I want to do a little commercial for our uh, first ever Wednesday evening service um, and church member barbecue. I guess that's what it'll be. Not we're having barbecue, you'll be barbecued because it's going to be hot. But I say this, I'll be preaching from the book of Numbers. And in the book of Numbers, the people of Israel have been outdoors for the chapter we get to 39 straight years. So I think we're going to be okay. So you'll get details in an email this week. I'm excited to get back into Numbers. We're going to finish Numbers if we get interrupted 400 times. We are going to make it through and enjoy a good time together. And you'll get details um, on what to bring and, and where we're going and so forth. Turn with me back to Psalm 15. Psalm 15, we'll start there. Eventually we'll be in 1 Timothy 1. While you're turning to Psalm 15, listen to these words. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of many peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And I'm reading, of course, from Revelation chapter 19. And what we see here is a picture of the bride of Christ, the church, and she's made herself ready to meet the Lamb of God, Jesus himself, to consummate the salvation that was begun on earth and to be joined into eternal union together. And that's what we have to look forward to. And to further drive home this picture of preparedness, the text I just read shows the saints dressed in fine linen, bright and pure, these white robes, as it were. And it says they're the righteous deeds of the saints. Now, that sometimes makes us a little bit uncomfortable because like it or not, God has deemed that the deeds of the saints matter. Works matter. And of course, the big question is just how do they matter? And I'd like to try to answer that this morning. We've been examining 1 Timothy 1 and looking at what we're calling the beautiful bride of Christ and what the church is to be, what we're to be doing to prepare for this marriage supper of the Lamb. And so far, we've given some of these preparations, elements of this preparation, New Testament preaching, effective disciples, Christ-honoring people, loving instruction, spiritual protection. And last week, we looked at Old Testament preaching but today we have to look at an uncomfortable at times and a blatant and obvious element of our preparation, and that is what I'll call holiness declaration, that there is a declaration of holiness. God declares that because he is holy, holiness, purity, righteousness, this matters to him. This is important to him. And when we get to 1 Timothy 1, verses 9 and 10, Paul is going to give a list of sins, a list of sins that exclude someone from being part of the kingdom of God. They disqualify someone from fellowship with God. They prohibit participation in the bride of Christ in heaven someday. And this sort of list is sometimes called a vice list, a list of vices, a list of corruptions, a list of iniquities, which inherently are disqualifiers for salvation. But this sort of list isn't just a New Testament phenomenon. It has its roots in Old Testament law. Remember last time we looked at using the law of Moses, the Pentateuch, lawfully according to the rules in 1 Timothy 1.8. But we also see this qualification, this sort of list here in Psalm 15, which we've, we've already read. So look with me at Psalm 15, verse 1. A Psalm of David, O Lord, who shall, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? Now, what does this mean? To sojourn in the tent of God. This is a picture of the traveling tabernacle of Israel. And it represented the presence of God on earth. And so that's what it means to sojourn in his tent. The holy hill is a little bit more permanent. This is the city of Jerusalem in general, but it is the permanent temple in particular, which replaced the tabernacle. So it's asking the same question twice. The question is, who may stand in right fellowship with God? Or put it this way, who may enter his house? Who may go into his house? Here's the qualification to be in fellowship with God, to be pleasing to God. Verse 2, 
He who walks blamelessly and does what is right. And then we read earlier the rest of this list. He who walks blamelessly. That's the qualification. Now, someone might say, well, that's the Old Testament. In the New Testament, there are no qualifications at all. Well, the Apostle Paul, in his writings in the New Testament, made numerous vice lists, as I've said earlier. 1 Corinthians 5, 10, and 11, he says that the sexually immoral, the greedy, swindlers, idolaters, revilers, meaning abusive people, drunkards, 1 Corinthians 5, 10, are of this world, meaning they are not of the world to come. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, Paul says that the sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, men who practice homosexuality, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revilers, swindlers, twice, he says, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. They are unregenerate. They're unsaved. Paul gives a list in Galatians 5, beginning in verse 19, of sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, and several other items. And he says, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. There's a pattern developing here. He says in 2 Timothy 3, beginning in verse 2, Lovers of self, lovers of money, the proud, the arrogant, the abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with deceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Paul says they have the appearance of godliness, but they deny its power. In other words, they're unregenerate, they're unsaved, they're frauds. More positively, Titus 3, verse 3 Paul says that the Christian used to be, at a former time, foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, filled with malice, envy, hated by others, and hating others. Now, what do all those lists have in common? Those lists have in common that they are characteristics of the unbeliever, the unregenerate, the unsaved. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 4, 22, to put off your old self. Verse 24, put on the new self. Created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And so again, holiness, righteousness, purity, these things matter to God. And I think that helps us understand where Paul is coming from. Now we can look at 1 Timothy 1, beginning in verse 9. And beginning in verse 9, Paul has yet another one of his vice lists. Those things which are contrary to holiness, to righteousness, those things which are required to answer Psalm 15's question, O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? Or, to put it in New Testament terms, who shall be part of the bride of Christ? I have three basic points this morning. First, to be part of the bride of Christ, you must be righteous. To be part of the bride of Christ, you must be righteous. And this is stated in our text in the negative sense of those things you must not do. Paul's vice list here is very organized. There are four pairs of vices followed by six individual vices. So even in sin, he organizes himself here. Pairs, lawless and disobedient, ungodly and sinners, unholy and profane, and those who strike mothers and fathers. Those are The four pairs, then you have the individual vices, murderers, sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers. And just to make sure Paul covers everything else, the end of verse 10, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. So let's look at this list of disqualifiers. These things you cannot do and be part of the bride of Christ. There's a lot, so we'll go through it fairly quickly. You cannot be lawless and disobedient. You can't be lawless and disobedient. To be lawless speaks in Scripture of believing that you are a law unto yourself, that you make your own standard, that whatever you think makes it right, makes it moral. It is to be your own standard. By definition, then, that makes you what? makes you disobedient because human standards will never match God's standards, especially when you mix in ingredients like selfishness and self-righteousness. You can't be part of the bride of Christ if you carry with you the idea that what you think matters. You can't. In fact, the church has always had what we might call the fringe element. People who like to start sentences with, I think, 
and they tend to see themselves as separate, distinct, maybe even above. Proverbs 18.1 identifies this person. Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. That's the person who knows better than the rest of the church, knows better than the elders, knows better than, than what the church has been doing for 500 years. It's lawlessness. It's disobedience. To be part of the bride of Christ, you cannot be lawless. You cannot be disobedient. Working our way through the list in, here in verse 9, to be part of the bride of Christ, you cannot be ungodly and a sinner. You cannot be ungodly and a sinner, meaning someone who unrepentantly practices sin. Now, in our circles, we often speak of godliness, godliness in the positive sense. It's a synonym for obedience, right? For maturity, for doing what's right, for growing in your faith, developing in your faith. But in its raw form, the idea of ungodliness simply means to continue living as if there is no God, to live as if there's no God at all. The decisions decisions aren't filtered through what would please God. There's no thought of that. Some have called this practical atheism, that the professing believer in Christ separates his life into the sacred and to the secular and uses very, very different decision-making processes and mechanisms in those two realms. Now, last week we talked about the usefulness of the law of Moses, that while we're not bound by Old Testament law, while we're not under it legally, since it's the old covenant God made with Israel, and we enjoy the better in the new covenant in Christ, the law is useful to our walk with Christ. And one of the ways that the law is useful is that it obliterates the distinction between the sacred and the secular. All of life is meant to be sacred. Last week, we saw that the law of God covers everything from marriage to money, from justice to judges, from family to food to signs to symbols, brotherhood to business, worship to widows. It covers everything. All of life is lived before God. Nothing's hidden from his sight. We don't change criteria to make decisions. The criterion is always the same for everything. Will this please God? It's always the same. To be part of the bride of Christ, you cannot be ungodly and a sinner. To be part of the bride of Christ, you cannot be unholy and profane. Still here in verse 9, you cannot be unholy and profane. Now this word for unholy, it's a unique word only used two times in the New Testament. And basically it means to be impious. And what that means is to treat life as if nothing is holy. As if nothing is sacred, nothing is set apart. Similarly, profane, it means to live life worthlessly. Live life worthlessly, to do things that are pointless, that make no difference whatsoever. I put it this way, to be unholy and profane in a very real sense is to provide an assignment to everything in life as being exactly the same. Everything is wasted. You see this in in retirement communities. You see people who are desperately trying to play that one last round of golf, desperately trying to do that one last thing because life has become essentially worthless. Nothing Nothing is of value. And yes, all of life is spiritual, but we would never say, for example, that having a good cholesterol count is just as important as reading your Bible. I think we have a sideshow over here. Thank you guys for that. I appreciate that. What does this mean? What it means is that it's possible to develop a set of ethics, of values, and priorities based on things which are worthless. They have no value whatsoever. That that there's no worth. What is the Christian call to? Instead, we're called to engage in that which is valuable, which has high worth, high value. In fact, there's an easy way to evaluate this in your own heart. Very, very simple. What would you be doing today if you had one month to live? And you knew it. What would you be doing today? What would you immediately drop as worthless, as pointless, without eternal value? Would you feel you need to watch that one last season on Netflix? I don't think you would. Remember a couple of weeks ago we pointed out that when Ephesians 5.17 said to make the best use of your time because the days are evil, the immediate context was the gathering of God's people together in corporate worship as being the very best use of your time. It's the best thing you can do. 
When the Apostle John was so old and weak that he couldn't even walk, he requested Sunday after Sunday that he be carried into the presence of God's people. When Job was afflicted with the loss of all of his children, with all of his property, Job 129 says he fell down on the ground and he what? He worshipped. And then when Job was afflicted with a horrible illness, he began to curse the day of his own birth. In Job chapter 3, he's so afflicted that Job is literally seated on a heap of ashes and dirt. Ashes and dirt, but in hearing near the end of the book of Job, this long, humbling speech from God about God being in the place of glory and Job being in the place of meekness. Job concluded in Job 42, 6, I repent in dust and ashes. But we've said this before, the Hebrew word translated repent here, in our English translations, the vast majority of the time is translated not I repent, but I'm comforted, I'm consoled. That makes much more sense. In other words, by the hearing of the greatness of God, from the mouth of God himself in the final chapters of Job, Job, in worshiping God, he's consoled in the dust and ashes. What does that mean? It means that Job's concern is no longer over his losses, over his potential losses. Can I put it this way? Every idol in Job's life has now been removed, every single one of them. And he's focused solely on his God, And instead of being consumed with what is below his agony in dust and ashes, he is consumed with what is above, and that is his God. No longer will Job be concerned with the unholy, with the profane, with worthless things. How many houses do I have? How many cars do I have? How much stuff do I have? How many vacations have I gone on? How can I fill my life with amusement? Instead, he worshiped. To be part of the bride of Christ, you cannot be unholy and profane. You can't. To be part of the bride of Christ, you cannot be those who strike mothers and fathers. Those who strike mothers and fathers. Now, you may be thinking, okay, finally something that's not irritating my conscience. Because I've never hit my mom or dad. Well, Paul's using an extreme example of disobedient, disobedient kids toward their parents. But there's a much bigger principle at play here. It's not just about family. The principle is is that how you view parents determines how you view all of authority. This is why the first line of defense in creating a society that functions under authority is to teach children to obey whom? Their parents. But to be part of the bride of Christ, you can't be one who habitually pushes back against authority just because you want to, just because you feel like it. I'm not speaking of when authority demands that you sin but when authority is inconvenient or does something you don't like. And so we could equally say to be part of the bride of Christ, you cannot be one who refuses to accept authority. That is not the mark of a Christian. We keep going in our list here in the end of verse 9, to be part of the bride of Christ, you cannot be a murderer. And now you say, all right, we're definitely on safe ground. I I won't even kill an animal, much less a human being. But Ephesians 4.31 gives us insight into a murderous heart. The Apostle Paul says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger be put away from you. These are big, strong words. Bitterness speaks of resentment and animosity to the point of wishing harm on someone else. That you're bitter to the point you wish someone would be hurt. Wrath speaks of self-righteous indignation that believes that I'm not deserving of the wrath of God, but you are. That's a murderous heart. And of course, anger speaks of sinful anger that would be very happy at the misfortune of another. You all recall what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. You have heard that it was said of old, to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. That's what's in your heart. Even the thoughts of your heart and the words of abuse are worthy of hell as certainly as if you had taken another human life. And so to be part of the bride of Christ, you cannot be a murderer. To be part of the bride of Christ, you cannot be sexually immoral. Verse 10, the sexually immoral. Human sexuality only has two motives, one righteous and one sinful. 
The righteous motive of human sexuality is to create and maintain the faithful and exclusive one flesh relationship in the marriage between a man and a woman. And the sinful motive of human sexuality is to seek your own personal pleasure for a thousand reasons, a thousand self-deceiving, rationalized reasons. Anything outside of the context of marriage is by definition selfish because it says that your pleasure is more important than God's holiness. The God's holiness in those moments doesn't matter. And very similarly, to be part of the bride of Christ, you cannot be a man, and by extension, any person who practices homosexuality. Verse 10. There's no mystery to this. There's no secret hermeneutic principle that makes this mean something different. There's no unusual, brand new biblical insight that says that no, homosexuality is really fine. No, it's a sin. It's a sin wrought in the mind of Satan because Satan hates the created order of God. He hates the created order. Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female, he created them. Genesis 2.24, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. That's God's created order and, and Satan hates that. Now, today, there's a new argument being put forth, by the way, that says, as long as you aren't practicing homosexuality, you can still be what they now call a gay Christian. That that's possible. Well, that logic falls apart pretty quickly when confronted with the fact that God has always been concerned with the heart as well as outward actions. And you would never use that logic with other sins, would you? You wouldn't say, as long as you're not practicing murder, it's fine to imagine all the people you don't like being slain. As long as you aren't practicing adultery, it's fine to imagine yourself with another man's wife. As long as you aren't practicing theft, it's fine to stick your hand in the offering box on the way out and grab a little something for yourself. As long as you're not practicing it, you can think about it. You can think it. No. To be part of the bride of Christ, you cannot practice homosexuality either in reality or in your mind. To be part of the bride of Christ, you cannot be an enslaver. Interesting word here. Literally means someone who takes a human being captive to sell them for money. Both the Old and New Testament forbids the selling of human beings. But we do note that both the Testaments also regulated the reality of the existence of slaves and masters. It just regulated what was the reality. Ephesians 6 speaks to bond servants obeying their masters. Verse 9 of masters to stop threatening. It's very important for us to understand that in the ancient world, slavery was simply a reality. And God's focus was not on fixing the world. God's focus is on redeeming the world. God does not have an agenda of social justice. God has an agenda of divine justice. And those two are very, very different. And that process of redemption is still in what? It's in process. It hasn't been finished yet. Now, never in Scripture does God condone slavery. In fact, here, as in other places in the Old Testament as well, it's an abomination to be a dealer of slaves, a seller of persons. Just a little historical note here. Historically, slavery isn't limited simply to the earlier years of the United States. Certainly wasn't limited to the black population either. Between 1530 and 1780, over a million white European Christians were enslaved by Muslims from North Africa, kidnapped in raids on the coastal cities of Europe. We should also note that slavery in Bible times had a wide range of definition. It was anything from the oppressive, abusive slavery that we think of and we understand all the way to someone who's called a slave who is essentially the manager of a large household who was well compensated, uh, loved by the family, and in fact could be quite wealthy. This is one of the reasons the New Testament in particular often translates doulos, slave, as bond servant because there's such a wide variety of usages. It could have very often more of what we would think of an employer-employee type of arrangement. Not always, but at times. So why do we get this command here about not being an enslaver? Well, to be very literal about this, today we have a different term for enslavement. It is called trafficking in persons or human trafficking. Just this year, a couple of months ago, the Secretary of State 
issued a 570-page report on human trafficking, and it's, it's huge, it's massive, and incredible abuses are happening today. Sports agents approach poor families in poor countries, and they promise million-dollar contracts with sports teams if they'll simply let them take their young child overseas and develop their athletic talent. And if the athlete, the young athlete doesn't work out, they're just abandoned, often with no means to contact their family. Children are sold for pornography, for prostitution, to be child soldiers. Children and adults are sold for forced labor. This is happening in India right now all the time. Refugees without identification are, are kidnapped. And ironically, one of the biggest problems is that United, the United Nations, that wonderful institution that people love to laud and praise, the United Nations peacekeeping soldiers are the worst offenders in human trafficking. They use their opportunity to kidnap others. Very lucrative, creates wealth for them. By the way, that's not something that just happens on foreign soil. Human trafficking happens 200,000 times a year in the United States. Our neighbors, the state of Nevada, the worst offenders, California is pretty close. Now you might say, that doesn't apply to me. I abhor that horrible crime of enslaving. But you know what does happen in the church of Jesus Christ? The sin of abuse. It happens in the church. Most often called reviling in the Bible. Reviling specifically refers to abuse of words. But abusive words are predictors for a heart that is willing to do abusive actions. Psalm 44 verse 16 equates the reviler with someone who is intent on violence. If you speak with your mouth abusive words, you are capable of other forms of abuse. Reviling in scripture includes verbally cursing someone. It includes characterizing someone as less than you, as insignificant. It includes a heart attitude of contempt, of disdain, of rejection. It can include being verbally intimidating, using the way you speak to get your way, to be threatening. It can include attempting to control someone with how you say something, with what you say. It includes a cutting down and a characterizing someone as inherently wicked so that you might control that relationship. It has the goal of controlling the other person's thinking and making them think so little of themselves that they are now in a position where you can manipulate and have them do what you want. Abuse has many forms. I don't have time to go into in detail, but suffice to say that any attempt to exert manipulative power and control over someone else close to you falls into the category of reviling. And what does that look like in real life? What does it feel like to the victim? It feels like enslavement. It is enslavement, being controlled by another human for selfish benefit. And yes, it happens in the church. It happens all over the place in the church. It has happened in this church. It happens in hearts. It happens with words. It happens in other actions meant to harm, meant to control. To be part of the bride of Christ, you cannot be an enslaver. You cannot be a reviler. We continue in Paul's list here. To be part of the bride of Christ, you cannot be a liar and perjurer. You cannot be a liar and perjurer. A perjurer is someone who lies in order to bring false charges against another person. We'll put it this way, it's a lie with more formal consequences to it. There's a reason that perjury is against the law, because it can wreck lives. But perjury of another sort happens when gossip and slander happens, the intentional tearing down of someone else without their knowledge or their presence, purely for the purpose of damaging their reputation, of making others think differently of them than is actually true. It's often been said, well, if it's true, then it's not gossip. Do you want everything that's true about you to be told publicly? No, that's not nice. What about lying? You can become so accustomed to lying that you begin to not even realize that you're doing it, that you get used to it. You become desensitized to it. You might lie to spare someone's feelings, and it feels like a good motive, but it's still a lie. It's still dishonest. You might lie because we don't want to appear that, that we've failed. This is the person who never owns anything, makes excuses for everything, never is able to say, I messed up, or I sinned, or I made a mistake even. We may lie by omitting a key fact that would change perception. 
We may lie because we fear the opinions of others or the emotional fallout of what it takes to be honest with someone. There are all kinds of reasons we lie. Now, lying is not unforgivable at all, but a consistent pattern of lying will can eventually lead people to what? They'll lose trust in you. You won't be able to be trusted. And so to be part of the bride of Christ, you cannot be a liar and perjurer. I spent a long time on my first basic point this morning, and that is to be part of the bride of Christ, you must be righteous. Can I tell you my second point? You have failed to be righteous. You have failed to be righteous. Some of you haven't breathed in 10 minutes. And I know why, because as you were going through that list, you were doing a self-evaluation, and not one person here has gone unscathed. Every one of you has been hit. Every one of you has been injured. You know what the Apostle Paul has just done? The Apostle Paul has, in fact, just compared your life to the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. Specifically to this part of the law. To start off with, there's a loose correspondence to the first four commandments. Paul gives a general characteristic of a lawbreaker, someone who's lawless and disobedient. And then he gets more specific. Let's walk through the commandments. The first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Paul lists in verse 9, the godless. The godless. This is to worship anything which is not God, to deny God his right to be worshipped. Whatever is more important to you than the worship of God may be an indication of putting some other God, little g, before him. There's a loose correspondence with the second commandment. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything to worship This is including even the likeness of God. Paul lists in verse 9, the sinners. Now, to a Jewish audience, this is obvious. Galatians 2.15, Paul says, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. What was the basic distinction between a Jew and a Gentile? A Jew, in Paul's day, worshipped the one true living God. A Gentile worshipped idols, sinners, idolatry. The third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. It literally means you shall not lift up the name of Yahweh your God to that which is pointless, that which is worthless, that which is empty. The name of God is the extension of his personhood, of his being. In the ancient Near East, the name of a person wasn't just an identifier. It spoke of his qualities, his character. It represented the person himself. We speak of our own good, what? Our good name. There have been many debates over what does it mean to take the name of the Lord your God in vain. This is a vague commandment and it's vague on purpose. It's meant for us to say, you know, there might be 50 different possibilities. I better not do any of them, just to be certain. It can include any careless use of God's name. It can include attempts to manipulate God for human purposes that praying in Jesus' name somehow is the formula to get what you want. It can include daring to believe that you speak for God prophetically, as some in the charismatic church believe. It also carries the idea of being outwardly associated with God. I name the name of Christ. I am a Christian, when in fact, internally, it's not true. And so Paul lists here the unholy The unholy, those who do not ascribe holiness to God. This is the opposite of the prayer the Lord Jesus Christ taught his disciples. Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your what? Name. The fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Paul here lists the profane, the pointless, the worthless. It generally speaks of ignoring that which is holy, that which is set apart. Now, we all know that there's no Sabbath command set apart for the Christian specific to Saturday binding the believer in Christ. This was a sign of the Israelite covenant. This is the very same way that the Israelites didn't participate in the Lord's Supper because that's the sign of the new covenant. But just a couple of Sabbath thoughts for you. First of all, Hebrews 4 uses the idea of Sabbath to point to the ultimate reality of resting in the salvation work of Christ. It is their ultimate rest. But second, Acts 20 verse 7 saw the church gathering on the Lord's Day, Sunday, the day of Christ's resurrection, to receive the Lord's table together and to hear the preached word. 1 Corinthians 16 2 saw the Lord's Day as the day when offerings to the Lord are to be given. 
The Lord's Day was the day chosen by Christ to appear to John for the final revelation from heaven. Revelation 1.10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. And whom did Jesus address? To whom did he preach on the Lord's Day, Revelation 2 and 3, to the church? We're not under Sabbath law, but we are to devote the Lord's Day to gathering together as the corporate body of Christ, as the church. So what does it mean to be profane then in that context? What it means to be profane, for example, would be to glibly go to the gym instead of gathering with God's people when you have the opportunity and to see those as somehow in competition. What's in competition with worship? Anything that is in competition with worship, listen, is an idol. It is an idol. It's profane. It makes the Lord's day pointless. It makes it worthless to ignore the greater importance of gathering with God's people. Now, in Paul's list, there's a strong correspondence with the fifth through the ninth commandments, and, and these are more obvious. The fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. Paul lists those who strike mothers and fathers. Exodus 21, 15 says there's a death penalty for striking your mother or father. Why is that? Why, why, such, why such brutality from our standpoint? Well, it's very logical, actually. Anyone who is that blatantly against their parents' authority won't accept any authority, and someone who won't accept any authority becomes useless to society. And so God has them executed. The sixth commandment, you shall not murder. Paul lists four murderers in verse 9. Again, Jesus clarified that in God's court, murder takes place in the heart. The seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Paul lists the sexually immoral and men who practice homosexuality. Now, why would we put homosexuality under adultery? Well, in ancient Israel, every man was married. Every man was married. And so any act of homosexuality was also an act of adultery. It was sexual relations outside your marriage. The Eighth Commandment, you shall not steal. Paul lists the enslavers, those who steal humans, the very worst of thefts. Exodus 21, 15 says, Whoever steals a man and sells him, anyone found in possession of him, shall be put to death. What should you do with human traffickers? You should execute them. You should execute them. The ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Paul lists the liars, the perjurers, those who protect themselves pridefully and hurt others with their words. And now that only leaves us the tenth commandment that Paul has compared to your life. The Tenth Commandment is you shall not covet your neighbor's house, wife, servant, animal, or anything that is your neighbor's. But if we look to here at 1 Timothy 1.10, we have run out of descriptors. So what do we do? The Tenth Commandment against coveting encapsulates 1 through 9. Romans 7 verse 8, But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. What is coveting? It's very simply wanting something that you can't have, wanting something that's not yours, wanting something for sinful, selfish purposes, and violating the other nine commandments includes coveting something every time. And given the fact that Paul is certainly referencing the other nine and the tenth commandment encapsulates the sinful motive behind violating the other nine, Seems most logical that Paul has in mind with his last general designation and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, coveting, everything else. How have you done? According to these tests, can you be part of the bride of Christ? No. You are excluded. You are prohibited. You failed. Verse 8, Paul says the law is good if one uses it lawfully. What is the law doing? The law exposes the sinner's true identity. Verse 9, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient. It's not for the just, it's for the lawless. And I want you to know this here. Paul doesn't just list sins. He lists your identity it's not people who lie, but liars. It's not people who are unholy, but the unholy. The law of God becomes a mirror which you look into and you run screaming 
from the reflection of a horrible, disgusting sinner before God. And the law becomes a court which has condemned you with no acceptable defense, no adequate defense, nothing you can say, no excuse will do. So now we can remember that Paul is arguing here in 1 Timothy 1 against teachers in the church who are using the law and their teaching in an unacceptable way. Verse 8, they were not using it lawfully, meaning according to the rules. So how were these teachers most likely using the law? They were using the law to make moral requirements which can never be met by somebody who is unconverted. In other words, they were preaching obedience without conversion without faith in Christ's atoning work on the cross. To equate righteousness before God as successfully keeping these laws, to encourage listeners to behave better so that they can earn God's favor, to earn a spot in heaven, this was their error. Now, if we closed in prayer right now, this would be a little bit depressing because you have to have the bad news before the good news. My three basic points today. First, to be part of the bride of Christ, you must be righteous Second, you have failed to be righteous. And so our third point is you must put on the righteousness of Christ. You must put on the righteousness of Christ. The law is useful, as we saw last week, but it is also has become obsolete. Hebrews 8.13, we're under the new covenant in Christ. The law can't be used as a moral code to earn God's favor. Instead, now we have this glorious freedom from the law given here in verse 11. Look with me at verse 11. Whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. What is the gospel of the glory of the blessed God? Well, we get our clue in verse 9, and this is the crux of the whole thing today. The law is not laid down for the just. Greek, the righteous. The law is not laid down for the righteous. Yes, the bride of Christ must be righteous. And you must be righteous to be part of the bride of Christ. But you couldn't do it. You failed to be righteous. You failed to be just. Who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? Not you. And not me. So what did you need? You needed to be made just. We call it being justified. Because you had no righteous garments of your own, you needed to put on the righteousness of Christ himself. And do you know what happened when you came to faith in Christ? This is stunning. When you came to faith in Christ, Romans 8, beginning in verse 3, says, By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, listen to this, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Did you catch that? In Christ, you have fulfilled the law in every part, every portion, every detail. And listen again now to Revelation 19. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen of the righteous is the righteous deeds of the saints. How did you get the fine linen? How did you get the, the perfect clothing of righteousness? You had to have your clothing cut from the cloth of Christ. You had to have your robes made from his. Or as the hymn says, his robes from mine. And now... Because of holy God, if you know Christ as your Savior, you are no longer and never will be identified as lawless, disobedient, ungodly, sinners, unholy, profane, those who strike mothers and fathers, murderers, sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers. You have a new identity. According to verse 9, when you're welcomed home in heaven, Perhaps an angel, perhaps God himself will say, look, it is the just one. It is the righteous one. And now you look in the mirror and all you see is Christ. All you see is Christ. 
And with that identity, you may freely worship God. With that identity, you may freely call yourself a child of the living God. And with that identity, you may freely look with eager anticipation to going home to heaven at the end of your life. For heaven only allows entrance to the righteous, to the just. And you may rest easy in 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become, what? The righteousness of God. What was your identity? Lawless and godless. What is your identity in Christ? The just. The righteousness of God. But that new identity has to be received by faith. It cannot be received by trying to do those things that we listed It means confessing that you have violated the holiness of God, that you do in fact deserve the condemnation of God because you've broken all of his commandments. James 2.10 says that if you have failed at one point of his law, you have failed in all of them. God says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But he goes on to say that you may be justified, meaning being given the very righteousness of Christ by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation, meaning a satisfaction by his blood to be received, how? By faith and faith alone. Who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? By faith, you shall. You shall. Let's pray. Our Father, even faith itself is a gift. We understand this. We know this. We know from Ephesians 2 that you have given us faith even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. You regenerated our hearts. You enlivened our spiritual eyes. You opened our spiritual ears. You strengthened our hearts and minds to know you when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And so we give you thanks, our Father, for having the graciousness and the love to reach out to us to a deadened humanity to take us by the hand to open our eyes such that the very first face we saw was the glory of God in the face of Christ and you gave us faith that by faith we have been saved and not by works because we have all failed those vice lists but by your grace Lord We are now considered those who are the just, those considered the righteous, those considered the holy ones, now a reflection of your holiness, all because of Christ and for his sake. We thank you and we pray in his name. Amen.